Hi, I'm Dr. Manor Haas. I'm a certified endodontist from Toronto, Canada. I've been practicing dentistry for over 15 years. I'm on staff at the University of Toronto and also at the Hospital for Sick Children. I've been lecturing extensively on practically every aspect of endodontics all over the world. Uh, but I take particular pride in talking to you guys today about something I find is very, very important in endodontics and can't be stressed enough. And that is instrumentation prior to the main shaping and obturation of the canal system. I'll talk about the importance of knowing what canal anatomy is, how to maintain that anatomy when instrumenting and creating a glide path all the way to working length. And then I'll go on to talking about uh, metallurgy, what happens to files, nickel titanium files when they're uh, under um, the endodontic procedures, what happens to them when they're exposed to endodontic chemicals. And then finally I'll talk to you guys about uh, single versus multiple use of nickel titanium files. So let's get started. I'd like to talk about some things that are very fundamental to instrumentation prior to the shaping and obturing of the canal system. A couple of goals that are very important to keep in mind are the fact that when it comes to shaping and cleaning, it's very important to remove all the organic material from the canal system. It's also very important to develop a purposeful form of the canal in order to receive the dense root canal filling. Some main objectives of cleaning and shaping that have lasted the test of time are to create a continuous taper funnel in the canal. Uh, the preparation should flow with the original shape of the canal. It's very important that you respect that canal form and follow it and maintain a spatial relationship of the original apical foramen. Furthermore, it's also very important that the apical opening should be kept as small as possible during the instrumentation procedure. I do want to add the fact that no root canal can be well obturated without an adequate canal preparation. That's a very basic uh, uh, principle, but extremely, extremely important. Now, all too often, canal uh, our canals are prepared and enlarged to a very small diameter in order to avoid procedural errors. And these errors may include ledges, zips, stripping of the canal, apical transportation of the canal, and even perforation of the canal system. And you can see in these images where we're looking at the apical third of the uh, roots, you can see in this case an apical ledge that uh, is forming. You can see in this slide over here how the apical foramen is zipped. Not to mention transportation could also happen when the canal anatomy is not respected uh, during an instrumentation. And you can even perforate the apical part of the root canal. Now keep in mind that I'm showing you just the apical part of these canal systems, but this could happen anywhere within your canal instrumentation. This leads me to the following point that's very important to keep in mind when it comes to procedural errors or iatrogenic situations. You can look at this image and see that there's a cross section of a mesial root of a lower molar. What I want you to look at is the concavity in the middle part of that root and cross section. And I want you to appreciate the danger zone, as it's often referred to, in the middle of that root on the frication side of the root. In this image over here, you see an anatomical view of a lower molar and the mesial root of the, of the lower molar. The image on the right side shows you that concavity very clearly. And what I want you to appreciate is how, when the root is instrumented, in that mesial root, if you don't appreciate that, that concavity, if you don't appreciate the anatomy, you can certainly very easily uh, transport the canal, you could cause a strip perforation, and you have to respect the apical uh, anatomy also, an apical foramen, when you're looking at these roots, as you see in these images. Now, on the left over here, you see a radiographic view of a lower molar, and on the right, you see an image of a cross-section mid-root of a lower molar. What I want you to appreciate is the black lines here showing the mesial to distal outline of the roots, something to keep in mind, along with these red lines which show you the mesial and distal outline of the canals of a lower molar, and the blue arrows represent what we call a danger zone. This is something that's very, very important to keep in mind when it comes to instrumenting because you need to respect this in order to avoid a strip perforation. This image over here of an extracted molar shows a strip perforation which may happen when the, the uh, root is instrumented too aggressively on the frication side. Now in this radiograph of a lower molar, you can see how the apical half of the roots have been under-instrumented. The significance of that is that when it's instrumented to a small diameter, it reduces the chemical and mechanical debridement that's possible of the root canal system. A couple of principles very important for cleaning and shaping and a couple of measurements that are very important to keep in mind are the vertical length of the root and the crown and the whole tooth and also the horizontal width of the roots, especially at the apical parts. Now there are guidelines that we have to keep in mind, and there have been studies on this. And there's a study going back to the 1950s by Dr. Cutler, which was about the microscopic investigation of root apices. 
very basic principle uh, when it comes to anatomy and endodontics, but I, I cannot stress the importance of this enough. What Dr. Cutler showed is how the apical anatomy and the foramen changes during the lifetime of uh, the tooth. In this slide over here, you see the anatomy of the apex in the patient that's uh, aged between 18 and 25. And then in this slide over here, you see how that changes as cementum is laid down apically in a patient that's 25 years or older. Very important to keep that in mind, the change of the anatomy and the foramen and, and uh, the way uh, this changes when you're instrumenting canals. What Dr. Cutler also found in the 1950s is that only 3% of the cases that he had studied showed that the canal followed the uh, routine anatomy of the root and it followed it all the way down to the anatomical apex. So not very often, in other words, very often it does not follow the anatomical apex. Something very important to keep in mind when it comes to instrumenting because you do have to respect the anatomy and the curvature of that root. And, and a key thing that I'll be stressing as we move along here is the fact that it's very, very important to preserve that anatomy. So on the left you see how only 3% of the cases in this study just had a nice, simple, straight uh, canal form. But on the middle and on the right images over here, you see how as the patient ages, the anatomy changes over time. A very basic part of endodontics is understanding pulpal anatomy. Going back to 1925, without the advent of modern technology and instrumentation, Hess already back then found and was able to outline the basic configuration of canal systems. What he also found was that there's literally an unlimited variation of root canal systems and you have to keep that in mind when you're talking about complete debridement and filling of the root canal system. It's not that simple and easy to debride and obturate this system uh, as has been seen by Dr. Hess and the complexity of the anatomy of roots uh, going back to 1925. This is something that we have to keep in mind when performing our root canal treatments. Now moving forward to a more recent study and thanks to CT technology and Dr. Cutler's uh, studies, we see that even nowadays, as Dr. Hess showed in the 1920s, that we have a very complex root canal anatomy, as you see here in these CT images of the mesial root of a lower molar. This is something we really need to respect when it comes to instrumentation of the root canal system. And that would lead me forward towards talking to you about instrument development and metallurgy. How do we get to the point where now we can more predictably and safely instrument this complex root canal anatomy? So I'd like to talk about that because it is very important to appreciate that. Stepping back in time, back to almost 100 years ago, here you see uh, a video of a root canal procedure by Dr. Ryan from New York City showing how endodontic procedures were performed many, many years ago. In principle, they're very similar. There was hand filing involved. It was mainly with stainless steel reamers and files. Rubber dams were used. But we've moved a long way in order to be able to, again, predictably and way more safely uh, perform root canal procedures and follow these complex uh, root canal systems. In terms of the history of nickel titanium files, this actually goes back to 1967. And the name Nitinol, I should say, stands for Nickel Titanium Naval Ordnance Laboratory. This was developed in New York for military purposes, but it's carried through to dentistry. The history of Nitai files, dating back to, say, the 90s, was different in the sense that uh, it had passive radial lands, the tapers were very fixed, versus as we move forward, the cutting edges were much more active. We had changing tapers, the cross sections were, were uh, changing also. And as we move forward with improved metallurgy, science, and engineering, the metals kept being refined and improved. It brings me to uh, current generation of nickel titanium files. One of them as an example is the M-wire NITI technology. Thanks to the grains, uh, the grain pattern of these files, they've become quite simply much more fracture resistant, much more flexible than what their counterparts were years ago. The bottom line is these files are safer to use, they help us uh, uh, instrument, uh, the more complex anatomies that we know exist out there, and the way these files are manufactured, they have significant greater resistance to cyclic fatigue. This is something that's extremely important in endodontic instrumentation. We're all worried about breaking files, so being able to now, in this day and age, have files that are much more fracture resistant and much more flexible gives us great peace of mind when it comes to instrumenting and, and getting into our glide path and into our main shaping of the canal system. Moving forward, we've now taken all that engineering, improved engineering and metallurgy towards something very important, which has in a way simplified our endodontics, but has also been able to help us perform endodontics in a much more 
uh, predictable way. We've moved towards single instrument glide uh, path creation. What one nickel titanium file can do nowadays is the equivalent of what many files used to do in the past. It's very important to respect the anatomy of the root canal system and to create a continuous tapered funnel, as I mentioned before, as Dr. Schilder mentioned many years ago. And this leads me to the glide path. This is, again, very, very important. Before we get into our main shaping, into our main obturation, preserving and creating a glide path and respecting the anatomy of that canal is exceptionally important. In this study over here, we see in this image how stainless steel hand files, as much as they try and negotiate the canal system and a curvature that we often see in roots, they still transport the canal. In this video over here, you see how a stainless steel hand file progresses through a canal system. And the problem is that it may not always respect that canal system. The more we work that file, the more it may unwind and create procedural errors. This is something we absolutely want to try and avoid, especially this day and age when we do have better engineering and better, better uh, metallurgy. In this image over here, you see the same system of, of canal, the same curvature as I showed you with the stainless steel file, and you can see how ProGlider, the new generation of nickel titanium files, can actually preserve that complex anatomy and the curvature of the canal system. And you can see, especially apically, how that uh, anatomy of the canal, of a curved canal, is still preserved. Extremely, extremely important when it comes to these complex anatomies. So here's a side-by-side. -side. On the top you see a stainless steel instrumentation with hand files of the canal system and the very same canal system on the bottom you see it instrumented with a pro glider nickel titanium file which is which is something i use routinely for creating a glide path prior to my main shaping the canal system and you can see clearly in this image how the pro glider is far superior to traditional uh, stainless steel hand filing when it comes to respecting the anatomy and the curvature of roots pro glider files have the following characteristics to them. They use M-wire nickel titanium technology. At the very tip, it's a size 16 files with a progressive taper. It uses 300 RPM, that's what's recommended. And in terms of regardless of the length of the files, they come in 21, 25, 31 millimeter lengths. They have an 18 millimeter of flutes that are cutting. Um, and they come in a three pack. And one thing that's important to stress is that they're single patient use. Keep in mind the work that you're asking this single file to do versus what we've used traditionally. So there's a reason why we recommend this to be a single patient use file. In cross-section, it's square and there's a lot of bulk to this file in cross-section, as thin as the file may be, but this also helps prevent or reduce the risk of fracturing files. In addition, when using a pro glider in comparison to hand filing, you save a lot of time when it comes to instrumenting the canal. So not only do you save time, but you can also preserve and follow the curvature of the canal system right to the apex, as I've shown you. In this ProGlider animation, you can see how hand files, small hand files, six, eight, or 10 as needed, are used to create a scout all the way to the apex, followed by the, the use of ProGlider, nickel titanium file, to create a glide path all the way to length. So as you're very gently scouting that canal system with a small stainless steel file, it's very important that you respect the anatomy and the curvature of that root canal system. I don't recommend you work it very aggressively, just scout very gently in order to create that, that path for the pro glider to create a, gl a glide path all the way to the apex. Again, this is very, very important and I can't stress the significance of doing this when it comes to your endodontic procedure. If you don't perform this properly, if you don't scout carefully, if you don't create your, your uh, glide path carefully, the rest of your endodontic procedure, including the rest of your shaping and your obturation will be compromised. So please, please appreciate the anatomy that Hess showed us, the anatomy that Dr. Cutler had showed us, the complexity of that, and trying to preserve that and follow that.
And with the advent of the new generation of nickel titanium files, such as the ProGlider, we can actually follow this complex anatomy. In this cross section of an extracted root, you can see how ProGlider can very nicely work its way apically along this S shape curved all the way to length. In this next image over here, you can see how ProGlider can even be used uh, to remove the bulk of a pulp tissue when instrumenting a canal. This is something you may find very useful when it comes to doing your pulpectomy. Now this moves me forward towards the, the basic step-by-step -step, um, procedures that you need to keep in mind when it comes to instrumenting canals. So before we get into our main shaping and obturating of the canal system, I want you to keep these very basic but very, very, very important steps in mind. First and foremost, we access our tooth. It's very important that you create a straight line axis from the coronal aspect of the tooth to the orifice. For this, you may use the SX Pro Taper files, just for the coronal part of the orifice. I'd strongly recommend you always lubricate the canals and use a very small stainless steel file, such as a 6, 8, or 10 as needed, file to scout to the apex. Once you do that, please also keep in mind we need to know our working length. So please use the new generation of an electronic apex locator to know your working length, keep lubricating the canal, recapitulating the canal, uh, scout the canal with a small file very gently, and then at this point it's important for us to now work on our glide path. Again, a very important part of our endodontic procedure. And this is where the ProGlider file works beautifully. So you can uh, create your axis, create a straight line axis from the coronal part to the orifice, scout the canal very lightly with a small hand file, always make sure you know your working length with an electronic apex locator, always make sure your canals are lubricated, scout again, recapitulate, use your glide path file, your pro glider to create that glide path all the way to length. Now this takes me forward to another important thing I'd like to speak with you about, and that is single versus multiple use of nickel titanium files. Something that's very important to keep in mind when it comes to the metallurgy of nickel titanium files are the following. Instrument wear, the mechanical properties of these files, and more specifically, their cyclic fatigue, their resistance to torsional uh, stress, their cutting efficiency, and also the corrosion of these files when they're exposed to sterilization, when they're exposed to uh, endodontic chemicals, and this is something that you really need to keep in mind. What studies have shown very clearly is that instruments showed consistent, consistent signs of wear and tear when they're uh, used frequently. So no matter how they're uh, treated on the surface, they do show wear and tear when they're reused. On the left in this slide, you see one side of a nickel titanium file, a brand new nickel titanium file. The same file is shown on the opposite side on the right side of your screen. Now after only one use, you see what happens to the surface of this file on the image on the right. And after two uses, you see now how the surface looks uh, with the same file that I showed you, uh, which you see here on the very left side. The opposite side of that same file, after two uses, is what you see here on the image on the right. What's important to keep in mind is also cyclic fatigue. There is a buildup of tension that studies have shown within nickel titanium rotary files and it depends on the, on the diameter of the file. So you keep in mind that no matter how good these files are, what the metallurgy is, there is, a, a, you know, there is something you have to keep in mind when it comes to cyclic fatigue. There is wear and tear on them when you use them over and over again. What also I want you to keep in mind is something that's not stressed enough, and that's what happens to the surface of these files in the form of corrosion. There have been studies on, the, on uh, this showing that when files are exposed to sodium hypochlorite, to EDTA, and other endodontic chemicals, that there is corrosion, literally corrosion, that takes place on the surface of these files. I want you to keep this in mind when thinking about reusing files. So to the naked eye, they might seem fine, they might seem clean, but in studies we've shown very, very clearly, after repeated use, after sterilization, after exposure to chemicals, hypochlorite, EDTA, and so on and so forth, there is corrosion. And you see this image right here on the screen, which very clearly shows really what happens to the surface of the file. So again, to the naked eye, it might seem fine, but please keep this image in mind when it comes to considering what happens to this file in reality uh, after they're exposed to uh, endodontic procedures and chemicals.
Another thing I want you to note is that nickel titanium rotaries have reduced resistance to cyclic fatigue after contact with heated hypochlorite. Now, we use hypochlorite in all of our procedures, so I want you to remember that every time they're exposed to the hypochlorite, to that bleach, that they're affected and their, their effectiveness is reduced. This is something, again, keep in mind, single versus multiple use of nickel titanium files. Now, the efficiency of these files also deteriorates as they're used over and over. Okay, so the surface of these files, the cutting edges, are less effective when these files are used over and over. And that's important to keep in mind what that does to your procedure, to the risk of fracturing files, to your efficiency of the cutting, the time spent on doing this. So there's overwhelming evidence of the metallurgic property changes in all aspects of endodontic instruments during root canal preparation. Forget what the naked eye sees. Studies have shown what happens to the surface and what happens to the structural integrity of these nickel titanium files. The complexity of the tooth anatomy that we now know every tooth has and the endodontic instruments have to try and uh, follow also affects this. There's more and more wear and tear. When you're working in a curved canal, there's more wear and tear and stress put on these files. And the chemical effects that irrigation solution produces on a root canal instrument is something I can't stress enough. The rearrangement of the crystals on the surface of nickel titanium files is something that sterilization uh, affects significantly also. Now finally, I'd like to talk to you about the cost benefit of single use versus multiple use of these files. And keep in mind that single use versus multiple use outweighs all risks in decision making of endodontic instruments. And I'll show you how I mean that. Now first when it comes to the risk involved in endodontics. Well, we may think that all files are clean and there's no risk on, on uh, passing on diseases from one patient to another or one file to another, but there are studies showing that this may in fact happen, that you may indeed pass on diseases and viruses from one patient to another. And this has been shown in studies in more recent years, and this is something we're taking more and more seriously. So keep this also in mind when it comes to single versus multiple use of files, not just the structural integrity of the files, but What's happening when we're reusing these files and potentially are we passing something on, unfortunately, inadvertently from one patient to another? So even in, in Great Britain, the governing officials in the healthcare system have now moved more and more towards single use files and considering endodontic files, endodontic instruments as single patient use. Now in terms of best practices when it comes to sterilization of files, this is something I want you to just keep in mind in terms of what you do in your own practice. The following is what we would consider as best practices nowadays. First, it involves wiping instrument blades immediately after opening them from a new box with a um, gauze embedded with alcohol. And before sterilizing this, you, use, you have to use a metal brush to brush the endodontic instruments with soap and under continuous water. And you also have to place them in an ultrasonic for at least 19 minutes and have the instrument loosely placed in the ultrasonic tray. Finally, that same instrument that you've cleaned so far, you also then have to move on towards autoclaving for at least 18 minutes at 135 degrees Celsius. This is what we would consider as best practices nowadays. It brings me to show you the surfaces of these files. Now here in this image, you see a brand new unsterilized file. And you see this is at 150 times magnification. When we look at more closely, I want you to pay close attention to what's actually going on with this new but unsterilized file at increasing magnifications. Please keep this in mind. Again, to the naked eye, it might seem just fine, but this is the reality of a new unsterilized file when it comes out of a package. Dr. Cutler also showed here the colony that could build up on these files that, have, that are brand new but have, have not been sterilized. You see it here in this image and then at a higher magnification right here. Now, when it comes to sterilization and cycling effect, wiping with alcohol is something we really have to keep in mind that is very important to do, wiping the surface of these files. Again, like I mentioned earlier, you have to wash this surface with soap and continuous water, use a metal brush to clean the surface. Hopefully you get all the surfaces and all the flutes, place it in ultrasonic loosely, and then autoclave this file. Still, I want you to keep in mind what we find on the surface of these files, even on, as you see on the image on the right hand side, after a second sterilization. There's still something going on, on the surface that we would much rather not see. Now, it's very important to wipe with alcohol, wash with soap, place an ultrasonic, 
autoclave for 18 minutes. But keep in mind, even though you're repeating the sterilization protocol, we still find this on the surface. So something I want you to consider. Based on these fi findings, single use of nickel titanium rotaries appears to be very beneficial. So even when we reuse our files, but we follow best protocols, we sterilize these files, with the naked eye, we try and clean these files with metal brushes and think we got everything out of these files and the flutes. Studies have shown there's still something that's left behind on these. You have to keep that in mind. Very, very important. And so this brings me to the point that we're moving more and more towards single use files, single patient use files when it comes to endodontics nowadays. The instrument present a presents a clinically significant risk of disease tr transmission after preparation for reuse and changes in the physical properties caused by initial use or in its initial preparation for reuse presents a clinically significant risk of instrument failure. So both biologically, we may be passing on inadvertently viruses and, and diseases to another patient and also reuse of these files also weakens them and changes their structural integrity. So as a final consideration to single versus multiple patient use of nickel titanium files, I want to mention something that matters to me as a private practitioner. The cost of reusing a file, the cost of sterilization. Now in these examples over here you see on your screen, the cost of sterilizing a file may range from depending on how your practice is, but just as in this example, anywhere from approximately $10 to $2 approximately per file. However, keep in mind, these numbers can go through the roof if inadvertently, and heaven forbid, there's a procedural error when your staff try their best to follow the best practices when it comes to cleaning and sterilizing these files. If there's a procedural accident, then the costs are astronomical. The well-being of the patient is compromised, unfortunately, of the uh, staff person, the financial implications are huge, and this is something that you need to keep in mind. And so the benefits of single-use files, both biologically, clinically, and financially, is something that I cannot stress enough this day and age. So to recap, We've covered quite a bit during this presentation. I've started off by talking about appreciating the canal anatomy, uh, respecting that anatomy and following that anatomy when it comes to instrumentation, especially using uh, nickel titanium files and a file that I use very extensively in my practice, the Pro Glider file. I've moved on to discuss the metallurgy of these uh, nickel titanium files, uh, the effect that endodontic instrumentation has on it, the effect that endodontic chemicals and sterilization has on it, and I've also talked about the single versus multiple use of files and even the cost benefit of single versus multiple use. So it's quite a bit that I've covered stuff that's very, very important to me personally and I find it's very important to pass on to you. I hope you gain something significant from this and uh, are able to take something from this to use in your practice tomorrow morning. And thank you very much for joining me. Best of luck. Thank you.